all the board of directors please stand up and be recognized. Give them a big round of applause, our board of directors. All right, thank you so much. Welcome to the CEO Roundtable. Uh, this is considered to be the premier moment of the ASES Symposium. Um, the CEO Roundtable has uh, been around for nine years. Uh, thanks to, of course, our good friend, the former president and CEO, uh, Carlos Horta. Thank you, Carlos. Can take, a, take a stand up, Carlos. This is... This is the ninth year of our CEO Roundtable, and this is the opportunity for us to have a fireside chat with CEOs, you know, the heads uh, of, of companies or heads of large divisions. And I think if I'm correct, uh, this will be the first time that we will have uh, an all people of color CEO Roundtable, Ralph De La Vega, a Latino, and Arnold Donald, African American, and uh, it's going to be, I think, a great gathering. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator. Uh, she is no stranger to the ASES CEO Roundtable. And she comes from Telemundo in the city of Dallas, Texas. So absolutely. So that's right, Dallas in the house. So everyone give a big, warm round of applause to Norma Garcia from Telemundo 39. They have Dallas. You pronounced that perfectly, Telemundo 39. <laughs> Thank you so much. ¿Cómo están? Buenas tardes. Se me olvida que mi micrófono está prendido. No necesariamente necesito esto. Thank you so much for being here. Every year I look forward to this event so much because I just wanted to share a little story with you about a couple of hours ago, I got a phone call, very important phone call in my life, and I just wanted to share the news with you because you have inspired me, and if there's a group that values higher education and preparation, I know it's this one. So I, I was really hoping to uh, get the confirmation today. I will be following or starting a master's degree next week. I just got the call this morning that I was accepted to the... Um, Master in Communication Management degree at University of Southern California, so I've been dying to share the news with you. Any Trojans in the house? <laughs> so that goes to show how much you inspire and how much of an impact you have directly and indirectly on the people that attend your symposium and beyond. So feel very proud of yourselves, ACER, Board of Directors, See, you have done a wonderful job. You have put together a wonderful symposium. Y como decimos en español, esperamos cerrar con broche de oro. ¿Qué les parece? We have two wonderful CEOs. They are very eager to share their experience and experiences with you. So let's get to know them a little better. First of all, we have Ralph de la Vega, President and Chief Executive Officer for AT&T Mobile and Business Solutions. Let me tell you a little more about Ralph. Ralph de la Vega was appointed President and Chief Executive Officer of AT&T Mobile and Business Solutions Organization in August 2014, underscoring the company's focus on delivering integrated solutions to customers that are first and foremost mobile and also secure, reliable, ultra-fast, and effortless. He has overall responsibility for the company's wireless and business services operations, which serve more than 118 million mobile subscribers in the U.S. and more than 4 million business customers in 100 countries globally, including nearly all of the world's Fortune 1000 companies. Raise your phones and let's just show Ralph how many of you are his customers. If anybody has a complaint, we will set up a different department at the end. In his previous role, <laughs> Mr. De La Vega was president and CEO of AT&T Mobility. Under his leadership, AT&T Mobility became one of the world's leading smartphone and mobile internet providers and expanded into new growth areas such as connected cars, home security, automation, and I think his next step was to uh, connect coffee makers at home. I read that somewhere. 
During his career, he has held numerous executive positions, including Chief Operating Officer, CEO of Singular Wireless and President of Bell South Latin America. As the CEO of Singular Wireless, Mr. De La Vega was responsible for the integration of AT&T Wireless and Singular Wireless, following the largest all-cash merger in U.S. history at the time. As president of Bell South Latin America, <clears throat> he was responsible for wireless operations in 11 countries, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Panama, Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Uruguay. He serves on the boards of New York Life Insurance Company, the Georgia Aquarium, Morehouse College, and the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. He also serves as the chairman of all markets initiatives for the Boy Scouts of America, and is a member of the board of Junior Achievement Worldwide. He has received numerous awards recognizing his leadership, including introduction into the Atlanta Business Hall of Fame and the prestigious Global Innovation Award from Gonzueta Business School of Emory University. Mr. De La Vega has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Florida Atlantic University, a master's degree in business administration from Northern Illinois University. He completed the executive program at the University of Virginia and received a Dr. Honoris Causa from FAU. He's the author of the best-selling book, Obstacles Welcome, Turn Adver Adversity into Advantage in Business and Life, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it. Native of Cuba, Mr. De La Vega and his family are your neighbor. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Ralph De La Vega. have Mr. Arnold Donald, President and Chief Executive Officer of Carnival Corporation. Arnold Donald has been Director of Carnival Corporation since 2001 and Director of Carnival since 2003. Mr. Donald has been President and Chief Executive Officer of Carnival Corporation since July of 2013. He was President and Chief Executive Officer of the Executive Leadership Council, a professional network of African American executives of major U.S. companies from 2010 to 2012. He previously served as President and Chief Executive Officer of Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation International. From 2000 to 2005, Mr. Donald was Chairman of the Board of Marison Company, manufacturer and marketer of tabletop sweetener products, including Equal and Candorel. How many of you have heard of those products before? From 2000 to 2003, he was also the Chief Executive Officer of Marison Company, <clears throat> From 98 to 2000, he was Senior Vice President of Monsanto Company, a company which develops agricultural products and consumer goods. As President of its nutrition and consumer sector, prior to that, he was President of Monsanto Company, its agricultural sector, and has been a member of the Boards of Directors of Bank of America Corporation since January 2013, Crown Holdings, since, um, and since July 1999, he was a member of the Board of Laclade Group, from January 2003 to 2014, Oli Dry Corporation of America and the Scotts Company from March 2000 to January 2009. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome with a big round of applause, Mr. Arnold Donald. Let me tell you, these two men already started doing business back there in the holding room. <laughs> we'll talk a little it's more a about that customer. later. Why not? I know, <laughs> huh? <coughs> All right, I hear you're going the extra mile for your customer here. Yeah, the truth is my phone died in Monterey the other day. <laughs> and I want to make sure it's my personal phone. You can see it's like iPhone zero. <laughs> and so, so we have we have to retrieve the personal data off of it. So I figured he'll know how to do we it. We can yeah, help yeah, you with yeah. that. You <laughs> and I am an AT&T customer, so that's good. Yeah, right. So um, let me start off with a question that is not the most pleasant one, but I do want to put it ahead because I know that a lot of people went to bed watching the news last night, a lot of people woke up this morning, and that is just on, seems to be on everybody's mind, the situation in Baltimore. My first question would be, to what extent is the private sector responsible for restoring racial relations in the country? Who wants to take that one first? Well, I, I, can, I can speak. You know, I did the same thing you did last night. I got home after a long work day. I knew things were going on, but it, it didn't really hit me until I turned on the TV set and I saw the fires. 
And, you know, we have a store in that mall uh, that had all the, all the problems, so I could really relate to the situation. We didn't have anybody get hurt, but the store was, uh, was vandalized. Um, and, you know, when I looked at that and I looked at the way we, we view the world, it, it strikes me that not just uh, Baltimore, but in other communities where we have seen uh, violence, uh, I think we could all be better off uh, if we follow some of the practices that we have in business in the local communities where I strongly believe that if you're going to be successful in reaching out to your customers, your company must represent the communities that you strive to serve. And the company has to have that from the very top all the way down as a commitment that that will happen. And I have seen our company go from where we weren't really strong there to where we now have an incredible diversity. And I think when you have diversity of thought, diversity of people, there's more respect, there's more balance, there's a better chance for dialogue and communication rather than violence. So you'll find that we're a big proponent of making sure that we have that diversity. And I think if there was more diversity of thought, of views, I think we would have a much better world. Arnold. Yeah, you know, I am uh, <coughs> very similar to you, Ralph. I, I uh, was in St. Louis uh, yesterday, and I had a briefing from the Ferguson Commission. So Ferguson, Missouri, you know, had um, uh, an episode and similar reactions and what have you. And from a personal standpoint, the media thing I did when we heard about it was, uh, and I get alerts all the time, was to make sure, you know, we home port a ship at a Carnival Pride. And I just want to make certain that, you know, the facilities we use, the hotels, et cetera, uh, that is safe for the guests because safety is first for us um, and is, is, you know, prepared to receive the guests when they come and whether we can still sell out, which we can. And uh, everything seems to be, you know, in, in order in that regard. But the bigger question, underlying question is, is, you know, it's just communities in general and you can go around the world. In, in our case here in the States, we've got a, a sudden plethora of these incidents. <laughs> Um, that have triggered things in communities here in the States between uh, our police force, our, uh, our institutions of, of protection and safety and security in certain communities. Um, but around the world, there's other issues, and, and, and there are different issues at times here. And it's exactly what Ralph said. I, I think the more uh, we exchange with each other, and that's what the Ferguson Commission reported, they got everybody in the same room together, and and they're processing through and they're looking at every aspect of life in Ferguson, every aspect of training uh, for the citizenry as well as for you know, the police force uh, to say what are we doing wrong, what can we do differently. And, and the most fundamental thing is what you all already know, is the fundamental issue of understanding and, and valuing each other. And um, the more as a corporation uh, we focus on diversity, which is a business imperative. Um, you know, we're only going to be successful in business uh, over time uh, through innovation. Innovation comes from diversity of thinking. And diversity of thinking uh, often is much more guaranteed if you have a diversity of workforce uh, and, and in that workforce. And so it's a business imperative to sustain success over time, but it's also you know, a life imperative for quality of life. And so I, I think every corporation has a role to play. Um, if they just focus on their own business, that's a great start. In our case, and I know in AT&T's case too, uh, the work we do in the communities, we go to 700 ports around the world, we home port in several cities here in the U.S. Uh, all of our partners that we work with, you know, have communities. Our people are all from, you know, communities across uh, the U.S. and around the world. And so our focus is to do what we can as a business, but then to reach out into the communities as well and prosper as, as, as strongly as we can this idea of valuing each other and, and celebrating the diversity, the diversity of thinking and diversity of thought and then the innovation that comes from it. So you know, we were discussing backstage, uh, you know, <coughs> it turns out that he's from uh, New Orleans right. and I'm from Miami. I was raised in an inner city neighborhood in Miami, so I right. think we, we can relate to the hood a lot, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I think uh, that when people at the top get it, you know, e everything yeah. is, is much better. I'm proud to tell you that at AT&T, 36% at uh, of our workforce uh, are, are made of females, and 40% are people of color, 4-0%. That's the whole workforce, but we also look at the leadership. 
Right. You know, 30 percent uh, of our leaders are women, and 33 percent are people of color. So it's not just in the, in the low levels; it's everywhere. That's when a corporation ticks. Yep. That's when there's disagreement. People can come together. When there's that understanding, everything is better. Yeah. And is and it like that I'm by design, or what? What programs do you have in your companies to achieve that? And also talk about the challenges that you've had in achieving mm -hmm. such diversity. Yeah. Well, f first of all, uh, let me say why we do it. We don't okay. do it just, I really, I really feel strongly that uh, diversity is not about counting heads. It's about making heads count. It's, and, and, and my best example I can give you of diversity, you probably never would think about it, but it happened to me in Washington, D.C. And many of you are based in Washington, D.C. We actually, had um, a young lady uh, that was working in our legal department uh, that was uh, essentially blind. Mm -hmm. and, and she forced us, because we, we gave her that diversity, she said, Ralph, why can't you make a phone that has the same keyboard that I use to type in my office? These phones that you make, I can't use. Mm -hmm. You know, I listened to that lady, and we built that phone. And after Aww. we built that phone, everybody else built that phone. Right. But it shows you that, <laughs> that it, it is, you know, her thinking right. made a difference. You know, her head and her thoughts made a difference, and we listened to that. So it's not just a number. We don't really just want to count numbers. We want to make sure that people are all the way across. And you have to recruit. You have to mentor people. You have to give them developmental assignments to help them get along their way. You know, across our nine brands, we have 120,000 employees, and wow. that, that 120,000 employees are from all over the world. And so um, it would be easy and convenient to say we're naturally diverse because, you know, we sail in 700 ports around the world. Our employees are from, you know, all over the world, and we're naturally diverse. You know, fine, let's go. And so diversity in a corporation really requires intervention. And um, the first program is me. So. You know, it's my job, and it's my job to do it not because it's the right thing to do, although it is. It, it's my job because I need to maximize return to shareholders over the life of the firm. And the way to do that, as I just said earlier, and as Ralph just pointed out, is diversity of thinking. You have to have diversity at the table where decisions are being made. You really do. And so in our case, um, across those nine brands, we have nine presidents for the brands. Um, and, and across uh, those nine brands, I, I have three women. Uh, two of whom, um, I've been there, it'll be two years in July, that you know, I elevated to the role, one I brought in from the outside and, and one I'm um, in. So across those nine brands, we have three women CEOs. Have one African-American CEO, first CEO of a, a cruise uh, line in the history of the industry. You know, I'm, I'm head of a cruise corporation, but I actually don't run, I run nine lines, but you know, I have presidents that really run the lines. Uh, he runs Holland America, his name is Orlando Ashford. He came out of um, uh, Marshall McClellan, the Mercer Group. Uh, there and, and uh, he's, he's been brought in under my watch. Uh, and I have the new head of procurement for the corporation. Um, we spend uh, excluding few and not counting people costs. We'll spend six, seven billion dollars a year on, on various items. And, um, and that's Julia Brown, who was previously at Kraft and Mundelay. My head of um, cybersecurity uh, is an African American we brought in. Uh, and in terms of Hispanics, and one of the advantages for our corporation is we're headquartered in Miami. So, um, you know, you, 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 you heard. Uh, we win them. We win them. Yeah, you, you, you heard from my um, general counsel. He was here at the conference, Arnie Perez. Um, so you heard from him yesterday. And, and obviously um, we have, um, you know, uh, quite a few uh, Hispanics in leadership positions throughout the corporation. That was a little easier for us because of location, location, location. Um, but at the same time, uh, we want that dispersed throughout the organization and not just in corporate in, in Miami, and, and we do a pretty effective job of that. But we have to stay on it, and, and we have to stay focused on it. And the reason for staying focused on it, again, is because it makes the business more successful. It, it really, really does. You know, it's not just you know, um, saying these things and whatnot, but, but the reality is the diversity of things. He gave one little example. Nobody blind being at the table, nobody thought about it. You get the person at the table, they think about it. And then if you get all these diverse, every business I've been, I've been in a lot of businesses, every business I've been in, if you get a diverse, talented group of people on a team, organized around a common objective, 
with a process for them to work together. They need a process because they're different and it's hard for them to work together. You put a process in place for them to work together, organize around a common, common objective, they will out solution a homogeneous group every time, every time. And, uh, and it's, it's just the nature of it. It's that diversity of thinking, that building on ideas, and just coming from different frames of reference. So um, we, we believe in it. Uh, you know, we have Carlos Orta, who I stole from Hacer, <laughs> you know. Carlos is on my team. Is he and, working out? Uh, he's, 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 you know, he's doing, where is Carlos? Yeah, he's doing, he's, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know uh, I can't speak um, Spanish. I have a little bit of Brazilian and Portuguese, so mine's the main one. No, no. Carlos is great. We're delighted to have him, and he's doing a great job. I, I did and, read uh, a statistic that 33% of all hires do not work out. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's so far, he's 67% doing well. <laughs> Talking about diversity, I don't know if you noticed, but I hope somebody's taking a picture because this is the most diverse round table we've had. We have an African American, we have a Cuban, and a Mexican woman. So I think. <laughs> Please take a picture because I want to savor this moment forever. <laughs> so. You come from very different backgrounds, but you have one thing in common. As I've been reading about you, researching on you, uh, I, I noticed you have an incredible ability to turn difficult situations into potential hits. How do you do that? You lived through the Cuban Revolution. You went through segregation. How has that shaped who you are today? You know, I think when, uh, when you go through adversity, only one or two things happen. It makes you stronger or it defeats you. Uh, I've seen people go through that, uh, people who came from uh, my bone background. And by the way, I don't recommend anybody go through a revolution. It's really tough. <laughs> but when, when we left Cuba and I came to the US by myself, without my parents, without speaking the language, without a penny in my pocket. This is when he was 10 years old. And with only friends to take care of me, those were really dark days. I mean, you'd go to school, and everybody there spoke English except me, you know, and so you, you're just competing. You felt like there were just nothing but obstacles in front of you. But at some point in time, and we can get to that story later, you get somebody that comes in and mentors you and says, you know, despite all those things, you know, you can still succeed. And then it builds that confidence in you that, yeah, it's rough right now, but if you have that optimistic look that you can conquer things, my experience is that Inside every difficulty, there's opportunity. And most often time, people don't see it because they only see the obstacle. They only see the difficulty. And most people walk away from difficulty. I have found difficulty makes you better. Go get it. Go get into an area that is difficult, that is challenging, and you will conquer it, and it'll make you better. And the more things you, that I did that way, the better I got. And that's why I'm here today. Wow. Yeah. You know, similar story and a little different. You know, I was um, young growing up in New Orleans, and um, uh, as most people are when they're growing up, they are young, right? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I was, um, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't know, you know, any better. Um, yeah, I was a kid, and so yeah, things were segregated. And, and the one experience, I had a number of experiences. The one that stands out in my mind, I wasn't even in kindergarten yet. You know, there was a supermarket called Schwagman's, and. Um, I would like to go with my dad in New Orleans. We say, go make groceries. You know, go buy groceries. We say, go make groceries. So dad was going to make groceries on Friday. He got in his check. We're going to go make groceries. So we went to Schwegman's. And um, I have been, we would go every Friday. It was my treat to ride with him. And um, I, I never forget, I, I was dying to go into the gentleman's bathroom because I wanted to know what it was like. So there was the gentleman's bathroom, and then there was colored. And, um, and so I was just curious, you know. So I, finally snuck into the gentleman's bathroom. And I came out and I, I was just like shocked because it was like so different than ours. So the, it was a white bowl and the tissue toilet paper, the tissue paper was soft and white and, and ours we had brown you know, toilet paper and the sink was uh, rusted steel and it was water on the floor and all that. And I, I remember asking my dad, I said, Dad, why, why is the white people's bathroom so clean and ours so dirty? And he had this look of fear in his eye. And I'll never forget it because my dad was my dad. He wasn't afraid of anything. He's my hero, right? And he was afraid. And it, it really rocked me even at that young age. And then he, he looked at me and he said, 
boy, don't you ever, ever go in that bathroom again. You understand me? And he scared me, you know, and I was like, and I'd never been afraid of my dad. He really scared me. He just had this look in his eyes. And he said, and, and the reason why theirs, and he calmed down a bit, and he said, and the reason why theirs is clean and ours isn't is because they have us cleaning theirs and nobody cleaning ours, okay? And I'll never, you know, it, it like stood out in my mind because a bunch of things happened in that little moment. You know, it, it shook my confidence in my dad, you know, because he was afraid. I never seen my dad afraid. It shook me because I was afraid of my dad for a second, which I had never been before. <laughs> and, um, and then the, and it stuck with me. And then I had a lot of other experiences like people do in those times. Um, you know, my brother is about eight or nine years older than me. He got kicked out of school his second semester of his senior year in college for skunk bombing the administration building or something. And, um, and, and I was a, you know, I was a wannabe, you know, because I, I went to high school in 67. I graduated in 72. So as you know, by then, the Civil Rights Movement was well over in terms of all the real good stuff. And, um, and so my brother was, um, you know, and I, and so I was a wannabe, you know, it was like past the time, but I was making up stuff to protest and everything. And, um, and so I ended up um, going to this high school, though, it's all boys, Catholic high school, St. Augustine in New Orleans. And we went to court for everything. So they went to court so we could play the white schools in sports. We went to court so the band could march in the Mardi Gras parades and, and, and the parades and stuff. And so they, and they won those battles. And so when I went there, all that was happening. And they would tell us three times a day, gentlemen, prepare yourselves. You're going to run the world. When we first got there, at lunchtime, and at the end of the day. And they drilled us. And their whole mission and they tore us down like boot camps. They tore us down and built us back up. Their whole objective was to say, look, society is telling you constantly you're second class. You can't do. You can't use this water fountain. You can't use this bathroom, blah, blah. But, but that's not true. Don't accept that. OK, you can do anything you want to do. And in fact, you are going to run the world. So you need to be prepared to do a good job at it. And, and that school instilled in us you know, a level of confidence. So if you, if you ever met anybody from St. Augustine High School, You'll know because they can't stop talking about it. No matter, where, <laughs> no matter where they went to college, no matter what. That's and right. we, we won national debate contests. We won the national math contests. Our teams were unbeaten. And I was going to there's movies about the basketball team and blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, a lot of um, people you had heard of you know, from the high school and what have you. And so it was just this little place in New Orleans with these Josephite priests who decided that they were going to take the best kids they could find you know, academic-wise. And, and then instilling them a sense of self-confidence. And so back to your point, I grew up very poor, but I never knew I was poor. I thought toasted bread with mayonnaise on it was good. You know? <laughs> and, and, and sugar and butter sandwiches was a treat. You know? yeah. And that was my lunch, and I didn't know any better. And, and so um, to me, as a child, you deal with anything. You know? And as you get older, you get perspective and you realize um, but the bottom, bottom line is, you know, life is just a journey. You got to enjoy every step. And um, the more you're confronted with, the stronger you can be. So at what point in those dark days did you, Ralph, think, I'm going to make this horrible situation, which I imagine for a 10-year-old boy having to leave his parents, because mm -hmm. I understand you all thought you were coming to the United States together, mm -hmm. and there was a problem with their passport, so they said only your passport was good to go, and you were the only one allowed to make the journey. At, one, at what point do you say, I'm going to be the best that I can, and I'm going to pursue an education, mm -hmm. or uh, how does that transformation work in your mind? Well, it's a very similar story to what Arnold just said. If, if you put, I mean, it's amazing the similarities to our story. So there's no diversity here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like there's no diversity of thinking. Yeah, we're failing miserably here. It, it's, <laughs> it's amazing how two so, so different people think alike, right? But in my yeah, case, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In my case, it was, uh, it, it was a case when, uh, when actually, after my parents got here, uh, and I went to my high school counselor uh, to let them know that my dream was to be an engineer. You know, I, I couldn't speak English very well, but I was really good at math. Mm -hmm. So I went to my high school counselor, and that's when my parents just arrived, so they didn't have any money, and they, they looked at my grades, and they looked at their financial well-being, and the counselor said to me, son, you should be a mechanic instead. And uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a mechanic, except right. that's not what my dream was. But I actually listened to him. I stopped going to regular high school classes and started taking classes to become a mechanic. Mm -hmm. Until 
my grandmother came, my abuela came from Cuba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> abuela, abuela was a mother of seven children. Um, she was a poet and a school teacher. And when I told her that I was going to mechanic school, but I really wanted to be an engineer, I'm not going to translate the first thing she said. <laughs> the strong, spunky lady. She didn't mess around with those seven kids. But I'll tell you the second thing she said to me. And every time I speak, I repeat it, because it's exactly what we were discussing. She said, Ralph, don't let anybody put limitations on what you can achieve. If you want to be an engineer, you can be an engineer. Yeah. And I did a control log, the lead on that counselor's advice, <laughs> and the rest is history. So that was. I see kids all the time. I see kids all the time, Norma, with this same issue. I just, um, I just sent a, a, a bunch of books and a nice letter to a, a, a middle school, and the letters that I got from the kids were unbelievable. And there were letters like, I really want to be a chef, but they told me I couldn't be a chef. Mm -hmm. When I read your book, you know what? I'm going to be a chef. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. just for kids that are that yeah. young and that they, I, I think we can make a huge difference. Sometimes we underestimate, you the people in this room probably underestimate the influence you can have. Because you are leaders, people look up to you. Those young kids, if you would just touch them, just like my grandmother did me, you can make a huge difference. Yeah. Go out and touch someone. Tell your story. Yeah. Telemundo is very involved in junior achievement, and I know that's an issue close to your heart. And when we go to the classrooms to be teachers for a day, we ask them, what do you want to be? And it's, it's very dip, the transition from when we, we talk to them, and they do want to be mechanics. Some of them want to be roofers. Some want to be, but, and that is, that is fine if that's what they want to be. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. sometimes they don't know any right. better. They don't know that they have alternatives. And so. My question is, do you mentor somebody? Do you mentor people within your industry and then even, maybe even younger? Do you Absolutely. think that's important to do? I think it's hugely important. That's why I'm uh, participating in Junior Achievement, in the Boy Scouts, and we have mentoring circles inside of at and it, It's one of the things that we, we really focus on because it does make a difference. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. In Junior Achievement, one of the things that we do is we teach young people about financial literacy, what it takes to be financially literate so when you graduate, you can get a job and be a productive member of society. We coach them, we mentor them to do this, and then they play a role for a day. They have a family, they have a budget, they have a salary, and we have this young lady that came from a well-to-do family, and we put her in a situation where for that day, she was the mother, her husband was out of work, she had two young kids. Her first response was, it's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> this is not fair. You know, well-to-do family, she could clearly see she couldn't make ends meet. At the end of the day, you know, they get all the kids together. They ask that young lady again, what did you learn? And she, she says something that is priceless if you're her father or any father. And she, and she said, don't marry a deadbeat. <laughs> <laughs> That, that is priceless, don't you think? <laughs> priceless. <laughs> Arnold, and I'm sorry, I skipped and I didn't let you, um, no, I didn't let you finish. When did you, is it true that when you were a junior in high school, you knew you wanted to be a CEO? No. Well, well, what, what does <laughs> what's true is, what's true is as a junior in high school, I decided I was going to be a general manager. A general manager. Okay. In a Fortune 50 science-based global company. Wow. Well, <laughs> and I mapped out a plan to do it. Most now, kids now, that at, it, at that age are playing. It was my high school, so they had brainwashing. <laughs> and so, PlayStation. look, I had no idea what that was, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I kind of had some, but I, you know, nobody in my family was in business. Nobody had run any businesses or anything, and only business in the family was the little sweet shop I set up in my room to get my sisters, when they wanted me to go out to the sweet shop, it'd be hot in the summer, they didn't want to walk, so they tried to make me go and give me like an extra nickel or something. <laughs> so I bought a bunch of candy and um, said, I'm not going, but if you want candy, it's twice as much. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it worked great until my youngest sister ate my inventory. But, um, <laughs> but, but the bottom line is, 
And my junior year in high school, I mapped it out, and I, and I really did. I mapped out a plan, and my philosophy in life was always maximize probability of success. So junior year in high school, I said, okay, if I'm going to do that, what do I have to do? Well, you know, I've got to go to college. I, I need to get an, an MBA at some point, blah, blah, blah. Well, if I want to have the chance of rising, I need to go to a really good MBA school. What's the probability of getting into the best MBA school in the country? Well, maybe if I get two undergraduate degrees, that'll make me different. Okay, and then if I have two undergraduate degrees, most people do like math, physics, chemistry, and then engineering. I, wanted to I had to get a technical degree, so I wanted engineering. And I said, I'll do a liberal arts degree and an, en and an engineering, and that'll make me different than everybody else who has, you know, two degrees and these three, two engineering programs. So I was always maximizing probabilities. And then in college, I decided I was going to, in, in business school, I decided I was going to major in finance, because I hated finance. And my attitude was, I hate it, but I have to have it if I'm going to be a general manager. Mm -hmm. And if I really get grounded in it now, I'll have the skills I need, so I'm going to concentrate in it. And, um, and so I was always thinking, how do I max the probability of success? And then the last thing is I mapped out my whole career, not salaries, not, I never paid any attention to any of that. It was what job did I need to have so that for the next job, I would excel in the next job. Okay, and, and what would that next job be so I would excel in the next job? And I interviewed um, CEOs all over the country. I helped found the National Society of Black Engineers when I was in engineering school. And so I met a lot of CEOs. And then in B school, I just reached out to them all and said, tell me about your success and blah. And people, as you know, if you show a genuine interest in them, they'll tell you everything, right? And so they did. And they told me what they liked about the job, what they didn't like, and what I should do. So in my arc behavior class in B school, I literally mapped out my whole career. Wow. And then I was on a mission to do it. And, and that's basically what happened. At a pretty early age, I was successful at Monsanto. Then my plans fell apart. Then I, I was very successful. I ran this, you know, the agricultural company for Monsanto, commercialized the biotech products and all that. Um, and um, uh, you know, made a little bit of money. Had a good buddy who was in private equity. We bought the Equal Sweetener business and 19 other brands. And, um, and then I was having fun buying minor league basketball teams, all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> and um, I had a lot of fun. And I uh, then decided I was going to give back to juvenile diabetes and what have you. But I, you know, I was having fun and enjoying myself. And, and then I was on the board at Carnival, and the call came, and I had no, in, you know, I wasn't even thinking about it. I never asked about, I, I never even thought about it once. And then I had to take a couple of days to think about if I wanted to get back into the fray again. And then I was stupid. I should have been begging for the job. It's fantastic. <laughs> but, but, but it happened by Sarah, all that planning. So I did the planning, was successful at it, and was fine. The private equity deal made another nickel, and then was doing stuff for fun and out of interest, and, and here I am again. And it so. worked out. And Rob, did you ever think you were going to become one of the most powerful CEOs in corporate America? No, no, no. I just wanted to be an engineer. That's what I, I was saying. <laughs> that was that. But you know, what, what he said is so profound because people sometimes think this just happens. You have to have a plan. You do need uh, Hope you need uh, and wishing that you're going to be a great CEO doesn't happen. After a while, you realize, hey, I can do this. And you can prepare yourself. And then the opportunity has to present itself. Right. Uh, it, when, when you're ready and prepared, all kinds of opportunities become available. And that's the approach that I took. Very similar, again. You just make sure you get a great education, get different work experiences. And I also, just personal advice to you, don't let anybody put a label on you, OK? When, when I was first offered a promotion, I was first offered a promotion in Latin America. And at the time, I turned it down. I turned it down. I said, I don't want to be a great Latin America executive. I want to be the great executive that happens to be from Latin America. There's a big difference between the two. So they sent me to Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> and it was great. It was great. Louisiana, was baby. Absolutely. <laughs> it was a great assignment, and the rest is history. But uh, I love that assignment. It was a great assignment. <laughs> In your professional life, what has been the biggest challenge that, that you faced? Arnold okay. Um, early in my career, the biggest challenge, and I didn't realize until I, I had a, an assignment in Canada, but I didn't, I didn't know until then. I never realized what was going on. But Canada, that job in Canada was the first time I walked into the room. I was young. I had a lot of roles. And I walked into that room, and people expected me to be there and expected me to know what I was talking about. <laughs> Every job before, I didn't realize it until I walked in the room in Canada. <laughs> I was, you know, the black guy. 
you know, the, the guy who was the, he must be the token, he's young, that he's the token, you know, people didn't take you that seriously, you had to say things three or four times before you were heard. And, but I, I didn't even have the distinction, you know, because it had always been with me. And, and I never had the distinction until I went to Canada and it felt how different it felt. And um, so unknowingly, that was probably the biggest challenge I, I faced. And it's a good thing I didn't know about it because I probably would have done the wrong things to address it, you know. But, um, you know, I just focused on the job and everything worked out. But, but that was probably, you know, the biggest thing. Since then, uh, well, right near that time, the other big thing was learning to work through other people because I always also felt like it was hard to team with people. Mm -hmm. And so I finally got an organization large enough in Canada. And good thing Canada was the first one where I, I just couldn't do it all myself. It was just too big. And so um, I had to learn to, to find out what other pe motivated other people and why were they there and not just why was I there and, and what turned them on and let them have their dreams and understand them and, and then organize things so they could realize their dreams uh, to get the most out of them. And so that was the second personal challenge for me was being used to figuring it all out on my own and learning how really to work through others and then find out that in fact, they're a lot better at it than you are <laughs> if, you, if you give them the opportunity. They're going to come up with way better solutions you're going to come up with by yourself. And so uh, that, was the, that was kind of the second thing. Yeah. Well. For me, I, I think if I reflect back, I've had many tough assignments, but probably none tougher than the one in Latin America and all those countries that, that you outlined. Uh, when they finally uh, gave me the, the head of the Latin American operations, <clears throat> it was a situation where the operation had never made money. Uh, they put me in, and then uh, the first thing that happens in Argentina, uh, the country has huge political upheaval. Uh, the uh, Argentine peso, which was pegged one to one to the dollar, got devalued four to one. Wow. So all of a sudden, overnight, my billion dollar company became a $250 million company. That really hurts the business plan for that year, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. They, they go through five presidents, and the country is in complete chaos. Uh, <clears throat> then in Venezuela, one of our other big properties, uh, I land in Caracas. Uh, the pilots say uh, there, there's a general in the town square speaking against the government. That's never a good thing in Caracas, right? <laughs> so uh, they have a coup that day. Hugo Chavez gets thrown out of office. They make the president of the Chamber of Commerce, the, the new president of Venezuela, the same day he abolishes the Supreme Court and the Constitution. And a day later, Chavez is back. And then all the businesses in Venezuela go on strike. Many of you know that story. So that's the two big countries that in Brazil, <laughs> our partner refuses to put up their, uh, their portion of, of, of a billion dollar loan that we had in the country. And we, we have to kind of uh, deal with a bankruptcy situation with that loan. You know, the loan was not recourse to us, but because the partner didn't put the money, you know, we actually defaulted on a billion dollar loan. Wow. Uh, and then in Colombia, uh, the FARC guerrillas uh, were blowing up our cell sites. Other than that, it was business as usual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Louisiana and Mississippi <laughs> looking pretty yeah, good absolutely. about it, right? <laughs> 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 right. And, and so how do, you, how do you, but it goes back to the point you made though, uh, Arnold, it really does. So how, how do you take a, co a company that never made money with that situation and make money, we made money the first year. Because when you get a talented group of people yeah. that are inspired, energized around the goal, they can make the impossible possible. You, I see it happen time, time again. Exactly. But you, got, you said a key word, a talented group. Yeah, and especially a diverse yeah. and talented group of people can yeah. overcome incredible yeah. odds. So what was the strategy behind that? You put the, the team together, how do you motivate them? How do you... Well, it was, we had our backs against the wall. In other words, for on. us to survive that situation, we needed to come together as a team. By the way, those CEOs, I had 11 CEOs in those countries. Each country had their own board and had our own local partner. So you couldn't decide to do anything by yourself because one partner in Argentina could decide, I don't want to do this, and you couldn't do it. But we decided when we came together, we came to Miami Beach, and we spent kind of a week in a hotel in a room like this coming up with a plan that everyone signed off. And then we went back and implemented a united plan to operate as one region, not as 11 countries, because we could save a bunch of money, wow. and it would help us get through that very difficult situation. It's exactly what we did. Okay. But it was really tough, because you had 11 people that had never worked that together. closely together. Yeah. But let me tell you, it was such a 
a difficult situation. The people from those countries, now it's 15 years later, still yeah. get together every year in the first week in December yep. in Atlanta to yep. celebrate that we survived. <laughs> yep. 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 We do. And, it, and to build on that, you know, we, we had a situation at Monsanto where we were trying to commercialize the products improve uh, through the use of mine biotechnology. And, um, and nobody wanted it except the farmers and us. You know, the supermarkets didn't want it because they were afraid somebody might protest outside and, you know, they don't make any more money on the products and uh, people wouldn't come into the stores. The uh, grain handlers like, you know, Archer Daniel Midlands and others didn't want it because they say, look, we signed contracts. If we can't ship that stuff to Europe, our company tanks, okay? You guys lose one source of business, but our company tanks. Politicians were afraid of it because if they lost 5% of, of a vote, if only 5% of their support base didn't want biotechnology products and, and they voted for somebody else, they could lose the election. So like nobody wanted it except us and the farmers and, um, and, and that was a, a major, but we knew we had to get things bulked up and we had to get it on the ships, which we had a right to do and send them over to Europe, even though, you know, we knew. And um, the trick was getting the seeds bulked up. This is soybean, Ronda Brady soybeans. Uh, and so I put a team together, a woman from Bolivia, a guy from France, uh, an African-American guy, um, a guy from the Midwest cornfields in uh, the United States. And I said, look, here's the deal. We're not supposed to commercialize until 2001. Uh, we're going to commercialize in 1996. And your job is to figure out how to bulk these seeds up. And the, and the germ of the idea came from the woman in Bolivia because you, you know, um, I don't want to get too much agricultural detail, but make a long story short, she said, well, we can grow sequentially around the world in one year. Oh, wow. Okay. And, um, and they, they have been stuck for quite a while on, on how to do this and what to do. And, and everybody went, of course. And so we pulled it off and did it. And now the, you know, at that time, Monsanto was less than 20 billion market cap and it had pharmaceuticals, chemicals, agriculture, they had agricultural market cap as well over $50 billion. Wow. And, um, and the reason alone, and, and the reason was because of this technology, but we had to get it out there. And so that diverse team thing triggered, and then the same story is all the same. So now at Carnival, I walked into a situation, you know, where we um, had had some voyage disruptions, gotten a lot of negative media, the industry was suffering from it, and I walked into that, but I have nine brands nine very powerful brands. Hopefully you all have sailed on many of them, and if not, it's time to do so. And, um, and uh, but they had never worked, they had never worked together. They had just never worked, there was no need to. The business had grown with the largest um, uh, travel company in the world, a leisure travel company in the world, uh, and they had been very successful doing what they had done. Uh, but we really needed them to work together. And so what I did was, um, it's a very simple thing, I got the presidents together first, I blindfolded one of them and put them in a Jeep. The other ones had to tell them how to go so they didn't kill everybody. And they took turns doing that to build some trust because they never worked wow. together. And I asked them three questions. What does success look like for you and your family five years from now? What does success look like for you and your brand professionally and your brand five years from now? And what does success look like for the corporation five years from now? And they had to develop that and talk with each other about it and so on. And they aligned. And they were ready to go. They were like, let's go. This is great. This is awesome. I said, yeah, but if I had told you those things, you wouldn't feel the same. You have 70 people that work for you. If you tell them, they're not going to feel it. So you got to be a little patient. So we spent a couple, about a couple months, pulled the 70 people from around the world who had never worked together, different languages, different cultures, got them in a room, made them do goofy things together, do build a, <laughs> you know, build a car, do you know, silly things to build some trust. Same set of questions, and I use this automatic response system. And um, I said, this is what you guys aligned around in your different groups. Um, don't get hung up on the words, because you speak different language stuff. Let's talk about the intent behind it. Let's have a conversation, make sure we get the intent right. So we did that. And I said, now vote. Do you align? <laughs> 70 people, everybody voted, 100% alignment. I did not expect that, wow. OK? Because that hardly ever happens. And then I said, and this is what you said is how to get there. This is the priorities of how to get there. 70 people voted, 100% alignment. Then I flashed what the presidents had come up with two months before independently. Same stuff. So at that point, I knew we're off and running. So we did 25% earnings per share growth, 14 over 13. 
and where you have guidance to do um, direct, I can't give you a tone of business, but you know, 25%, <laughs> you know, that's our guidance is uh, 25% this a great year over last year. A great story. And, and the reality is, 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 you know, business is complicated, but it's simple. And then, you know, uh, you just have to have talented people organized around a common objective, and they will find ways to make things work. By the way, one of the secret weapons for us in Latin America was women. When, when we first got there, there were virtually no women in senior positions. After we looked at it three years later, we had a CFO, a general counsel, we had a head of marketing, head of sales in all those countries. And quite frankly, we found that they were underutilized. You know, so my competition wasn't using them either. But 50% of our customers are women. Right. That's nuts. You know, how could you not have women as part of your leadership team? So those are the kind of things you say is simple, right. but it takes discipline to make sure that the, the leadership team buys into it. Well, those are great success stories. Now I want to know the opposite side. Do CEOs make mistakes? Sure. I don't think Ralph has, but, <laughs> but I have a long list I can share. <laughs> and I have to credit Sid for this, for this question. What has been your best, worst mistake? The one that has taught you the most? The one that at that time you thought, oh my god, but then it has sort of led you to where you are today. We have an interesting case, and you know, in the uh, in the in the business that we're in, we we come up with a lot of new products, uh, especially a lot of phones. And I can tell you about the worst phone that we uh, came up with, uh, <laughs> and how that led to an unbelievable success. But I don't know how many here bought the Motorola Rocker. Did you ever remember that phone? The Rocker. The Rocker was the first phone in the world that had iTunes built into it. Ah. We had a hundred songs that you could put. In, in the rocker because we thought that a phone and music went together. So we had this joint venture with Motorola, with Apple, and uh, Singular at the time. I was the CEO of Singular. Mm -hmm. So we worked with Ed Sandra at Motorola, Steve Jobs at Apple, and we rolled out this phone. It was a huge failure. <laughs> it's a huge, I still have one in my house just to make me feel good. <laughs> what was it a huge failure? Uh, it, it just, the market, didn't accept it. They, instead of 100 songs, they wanted like 1,000 songs. Go figure out, right? Yeah. But we, we didn't make it easy enough to use. The interface was a little bit clunky. It was the first product made, and it just, it just failed. Uh, and after that, Steve Jobs decided he's going to make a phone. Yeah. And he called us, and he says, I want to work with you to make the next phone. That next phone turned out to be the iPhone, and it's dramatically changed the world. Yeah. Wow. I was lucky enough to be probably one of the first people to ever see an iPhone. I actually had really? to sign a non-disclosure agreement with Steve Jobs that I would not tell anyone, including my boss, including my board, and including my wife. So after he shows it to me, of course, I get back, and, and my CEO says, what does it look like? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you, but it's going to change the world. <laughs> we need to do this deal. Yeah. And uh, that dramatically changed uh, completely yeah. an industry uh, that's yeah. still successful. Today, but it began with a fake. Hmm. Yeah. 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 How many years ago was that? Uh, that was, the, the phone was launched in 2007, so this is around 2005. Wow, yeah. amazing. Arnold? A um, couple of them. So um, uh, we decided we were going to change the world in China okay. when I was in agriculture. And um, uh, what we wanted to do, there was a product, um, it's an active ingredient called glyphosate, but it's Roundup herbicide. You guys might use it around home. And, um, <laughs> Uh, there were a lot of companies, as is the case in China often, uh, that were starting to make glyphosate. So we thought if we could manage the marketing of the glyphosate, which would have been a legal thing to do um, for China, then um, you know, we could positively impact the industry. And in exchange for that, we could fast forward their productivity by bringing them some biotechnology stuff that we knew they just absolutely wanted to have. And so um, I spent a year. Uh, going back and forth to China in the leadership compound, met with Zhu Rongji a number of times and his, his, his whole team. And uh, it was about the, I don't know, fifth or sixth meeting when, um, might have been even longer than that, when one of his ministers pulled me on the side and said, you know, there's something really important you must understand. This is a very good lesson. And um, I said, well, what's that? He said, well, you know, agriculture is in the forefront of every five-year plan here in China. Do you know why? And I said, well, I know it is, and yeah, you have to feed your people. He said, that's right. We must feed our people. He said, now, there's something else you must know. We can't afford to feed them too well. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we want no one hungry, but 
if there's nothing for those hundreds of millions of people out in you know, the central part of China to do, they're all going to want to move to the cities. And we can't handle that. So this productivity thing you keep talking about, how rapidly you're going to grow productivity and so on and so forth, this is in the 90s. How rapidly you're going you're to grow productivity, you need to back off on that a little bit. Okay? <laughs> we, 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 will we will increase productivity, but we have to manage this so the population is safe and secure. We don't want anybody being hungry, but we need them occupied and, and working because otherwise they will all want to just move to the cities. And we can't handle that. And so, you know, for the first seven or eight meetings, I'm selling the wrong thing. It's fun fundamental selling, right? Understand your customers' needs, okay? Right. Which I clearly did not. And um, so, you know, that was a mistake. Now, what came out of that, though, was, again, we had a great relationship with the Chinese government. We did transfer some technology. The company made, you know, a ton of money. It's added to the shareholder value, so on and so forth. But, um, but, but that was one. Now, you're going to have to wait a while for Carnival. I've only been there a year and a half, so, you know, you have to, you have to see how I messed that all up in, a, in a, another year or two. Um, uh, but the other one is a personal one, and I know this is, you guys are interested in this from a, uh, uh, your own managing things. Um, there was, uh, when I had the sweetener business, the private equity deal I did, uh, the sweetener at the time is equal sweetener. Uh, we really needed to um, promote the brand more, okay? And so uh, I, I had a marketing team that just wasn't getting there. So I ran up to Canada, uh, took my um, wingman with me, Carl Sestak, who's sitting been with me 30-something years and helping me in different businesses. And, you know, we cast a commercial, we hired a director from Australia, we did all this stuff, and we, we produced this great 60-second commercial using the slide, you know, the, the, the Casper slide, you know, Casper, the singing the slide. Uh, so um, using that, and it was a great commercial. And then I decided, okay, I've pushed this far enough. I need to let the team now own it, okay? Which, of course, they didn't own because they didn't produce it, they didn't, all right? <laughs> so they came up with another really dull ad, <laughs> okay? And, uh, and they never ran it. And so, um, uh, and, and I thought in that moment, and, and so the business never took off the way, we still did fine, it was a financial deal, we did okay, okay? But in terms of you know, building the brand and what the opportunity was, that opportunity never got realized. And um, so more recently, we just did a Super Bowl uh, commercial this year. And I told my team, and there was, you know, question, we never, Carnival never done Super Bowl, blah, blah, blah. They never done one with nine brands. How are you going to do nine brands on a TV spot and all that? So we have to just create excess demand for us to be able to get the yields up for us to drive. We cannot drive revenue by building ships. We can, but we have 101 ships. So we build another ship, that's one. We build two ships, that's two. Three ships in a year is three. We're growing three or four percent. Shareholders are not going to chase three or four percent growth. So we have to have more revenue. So the way to get there is, you know, where great, greatest vacation value there is is cruising, greatest vacation experience there is is cruising. But, so there's plenty of room for us to move on price and still be the greatest value. So we have to have excess demand. So I said, we've got to generate some noise, and it's going to help the whole industry, but it's okay. And so what we decided to do was, and I told him, I said, here's your mission. Okay, we're going to do a Super Bowl spot. It has nothing to do with the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is the cachet. It's all about PR. We need to win before we ever run the spot, okay? We have to win before the spot ever runs. So let's figure out how we're gonna do that. So we came up, we decided to hire this great director, we produced four TV spots, put them in social media, ran contests, all that. So before that spot ever ran, we had over five billion media impressions before the spot ever ran on Super Bowl Sunday. Because the cachet of Super Bowl is, you know, people love it, and if you, and the media loves it. So we generated conversations around cruising. And then after the spot ran, uh, the impressions, we, we did over 10 billion impressions, which is really good. Wow. And it was real conversation. I did four and a half hours of TV interviews after Super Bowl, 4,000 articles. But the message there was, along the way, I had marketing teams that said, well, I don't you know, because they had to come up with it. And this time I said, it doesn't matter. We're doing this, whatever, and we're going to do it right. And, and it worked. And it worked. Great. It's a great so, story. Yeah. I have one last question for you, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. My question for both of you is, what is the part of the job that you enjoy the most, the most fun that you have on the job, Rob? Working with people. I mean, uh, uh, to me, if you can't work with a large group of people and have fun, it's a pretty miserable thing. So <laughs> I, I love getting teams together. The same story that we've had 
inspiring them, and then seeing them achieve. There's nothing that I take greater pride than when you charge a team, you have them uh, with the right tools, and that they take the hill. That, that is nirvana for me. When, and when I think you as a leader take a team and have them achieve something that they thought was impossible to achieve, then you've got the greatest level of leadership that's ever been possible. Arne? I totally agree. The, the thing for us is, look, we're in the business of making fun. That's what we do. And if you can't have fun making fun, you need your head examined, okay? So, <laughs> so my, my job right now is a total blast. I mean, it is unbelievably fun. Do you cruise and a lot? I'm on ships a lot. I can't cruise a lot. You I can't can take the time. But I did do two days at a time joining a cruise, though. And I'm, st and I'm still paying the price. That was about uh, two weeks ago, whenever it was, and I'm still, and I'm still hurting. But, um, but the bottom line is that, you know, for us, 120,000 employees, and from the day I started, the employees are totally passionate and committed. They love what they're doing. And as for the crew on the ship, happy crew, happy guests. You know, if we have a happy crew, the mm -hmm. guests are going to be well taken care of, and our business is exceeding guest expectations. If we do that consistently, we have a foundation that we can get returns for the shareholders. We don't do that well, we don't have a business. So it's exceeding the guest expectations, and a happy crew does that. But our people are just, it's, it's just interesting. I'm from New Orleans originally. There's no diversity here, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. I'm from New Orleans originally, and, and we're just people, people. And, and uh, it's all about the human spirit. And, and, it's, and so in connecting with that, and in this job, I get to do it every day, multiple ways, and, and it's just uh, a rush every day. It's really cool. Do you get the royal treatment when you get on that ship? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> so they asked me to do um, Undercover Boss. <laughs> they would recognize you yeah, right yeah. away. <laughs> so we, we, we may have found one of our, uh, I, I may have set one of our guys up to do it, and, and um, I won't say anything, because uh, it's probably going to happen, and he'll be in serious disguise. <laughs> but um, but I, it would have been hard to do. But, but the reality is, um, of course, you know, they, um, uh, but, but we give, you guys will get the royal treatment, you know, because <laughs> we, our goal is to exceed guest expectations. And, um, you know, that's what it's all about. Uh, and then I was, um, two weeks ago, I had the privilege of being, we named the ship the Britannia, now p and a line in the UK, and um, Her Majesty the Queen was the godmother. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I had the opportunity to uh, give her a tour of the ship and lunch and all that stuff. It was pretty cool. Um, but again, you know, she was treated royally um, <laughs> by, by our crew, uh, but was so, so was every other guest, you know, and, and um, you know, that's the common thing for our business. So if you haven't cruised with us, you need to, and um, I got to get my plug in. You got to use AT&T. There you go. <laughs> All right. Yeah, We're together go. here, baby. Yeah, there yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah, we're good, baby. We're good. And, um, <laughs> You can use AT&T on our ship. There you go. Yeah, and that'll work. That'll it work. Works. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Who wants to take the first question? In the back. Over there in the back. If you can please introduce yourself and sure. uh, Henry tell us Ramirez, your I'm a manager with ADP, uh, the human capital company, not the payroll company. Only, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> An AT&T customer since 2006. I'm on my fifth iPhone or whatever it is. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> took my dad to his 70th birthday on Carnival. Hey, thank to you. The Bahamas. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank and <clears throat> my question to you is: You both had challenges at your company um, with losing the iPhone exclusivity. You know that's my question to you is. How do you face that? And for Carnival, we know the problems in the past. How do you face that? Yeah, from the iPhone exclusivity point of view, we knew that it was a matter of time. So we, we prepared for that. But my God, the learnings that you had to work with somebody of the talent of a Steve Jobs and to understand how they simplify things and make things great, it's a huge learning experience for us. So when you look at after the iPhone exclusivity, if you look at our results just last year, uh, post the iPhone exclusivity, it's the lowest customer churn number that we've had in the company's history, the highest margins, and we won seven out of the last eight JD Power Awards for customer service. So I think we learned something along the journey, and that's continued in our company. So you, you have to learn and learn from the best, and we had a, and still have a great relationship, not only with uh, Tim Cook now, but with everybody at, at Apple, they're a great, uh, a great team.
team, and we worked great with them. The cruise industry, um, you know, uh, hit some headwinds. And so in the 2007, 2008 periods when things peaked, and uh, we were the only company at that time to achieve double digit return on invested capital as a cruise company, uh, but we fell back to the pack after that. And then what further aggravated that was the voyage disruptions, the Casa Concordia, which was a real tragedy in, in, um, in Italy, and then the, um, uh, the Triumph, uh, which was a CNN tragedy. Um, you know, uh, uh, because it, nobody got nobody got hurt, nobody was injured. The ship was not a you know ship was not adrift at sea, and all that was being told and so on. But that's okay. So so that happened, and uh, and that put a damper on demand because the trick in the cruising is pretty simple. People who cruise a lot, who cruise a lot, that stuff doesn't affect them at all. They know they experience it. We have 80 million passenger cruise days a year, so you know some little things happen, but the vast majority of people just had the time of their life. That's, that's basically what happens in the business, and they love it. So people who cruise a lot, no impact. People who have never cruised. And so on every ship, whether it's ours or, or one of the other companies in the business, I don't even call them my competitors, and we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, what, what happens uh, in, in those is that you have a percentage of people that's new to cruise. Could be 10, 15, 25, 30% on any given ship and any given itinerary. And those people have never cruised. So there's a reason they haven't. There's usually some myth about cruising. Uh, I'm going to be in a line with three, a buffet line with 3,000 people. Uh, it's only for young people who want to get drunk. It's only for old people. You know, they say both those things, right? I want to get drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <on. laughs> Some say it's only for old people who sleep all the time. And so you have all these myths and stuff. And so getting that person to cross that hurdle to take that chance to go is a test. So when the media beats you up and puts a negative spin on things, it keeps them away. And so that then causes you, when you're trying to fill those last few cabins, you know, lower prices, so on and so forth. And then the people who are cruising, you know, so they book early, you guarantee them if the price goes down, we'll match or whatever, and so it, it impacts your whole, your whole thing. So that's the dynamic, all right? So given that, we had a couple of things we had to do. We had to restore confidence in the brand, not for the people who cruise a lot, because they never lost their confidence, but more in the general public. And then the second thing we had to do was we had to get the media to at least be neutral because they were really beaten up on the cruise industry and have been for several years. And so that was the task. So I brought in a guy who, who ran previously um, PR for American Airlines. He had seen a few crises, you know. And, um, <laughs> and so, so we went to work on the media. And uh, we, you know, have been reasonably successful. There's no magic there. It's just you have to be proactive and you have to be responsive. So if you give them enough information, right. most media people really want to do real news, okay? Now, they'll do the spectacular story every now and then, you know. Um, but in the main, if you give them enough information and give them perspective, mm -hmm. you can shape that a bit. And so if you've looked over the last year plus, you know, there's a lot more positive news or at least neutral and a balanced story. So when Ebola happened, we had a, um, a person from the Presbyterian Hospital in Texas on our ship who worked in the blood lab and she was on one of our ships. While she was on the ship, the CDC changed their rules, okay, for travel for people who were hospital workers that had been in a hospital that, that had an Ebola patient. So she didn't want to lose her job. She just wanted to get off the ship, so she didn't buy it. She didn't have Ebola. She had never touched a patient. She just worked in a blood lab, okay, and was a supervisor at that in the blood lab, okay. Um, but the bottom line was, you know, it became an issue because you had 11 different departments and the government on the phone and all this and to get her off the ship. Uh, and then the countries, you know, zero risk, like, hey, am I going to let off in my country? Because, like, even if there's nothing going on, people may vote me out because they say, you idiot, you expose us or something, even though she didn't have Ebola. Mm -hmm. Turns out I'm supposed to be on Quest for Business that week, okay? And um, so I'm in the studios in New York, and this is all happening, and I'm thinking, they're going to kill me. You know, because the last thing I want is Ebola carnival. Because right. <laughs> no matter what's said, all people are going to remember is Ebola carnival. carnival. It don't matter what the conversation is, okay? It doesn't matter. And so I'm thinking, you know, gosh, now we have spent a lot of time with Richard and done a bunch of favors for him and all that. And when we got on air, they wrote positive B-roll, okay? And he never once 
put e he asked the Ebola question, but he never once flashed anything to say Ebola carnival, and never once did he say Ebola carnival in the same phrase, okay? And so a year earlier, we'd have been crucified. Even though we had done nothing, the woman did not have Ebola or anything like that, but we would have been annihilated. And so, so that was a, you know, the thing we had to do up front was to just you know, get with the media to the point where we had a chance of it being more neutral. And we stopped a lot of stories, and, and not with anything other than information. You know, we, right. you know, we provide enough information, mm -hmm. the story's self-checked. You know, because we have 80 million passenger cruise days a year, 10 and a half million guests. We're a big city, okay? Everything happens. But the reality is, just because one little thing happens on a cruise ship, is that really news? Okay, like if it happens in a city, is it news? Somebody got robbed in the city. Well, yeah, right? <laughs> uh, so is that really like national news, you know, right? No, and so it really shouldn't be news for us either if it's those kinds of things. So that's, you know, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Another question? Right here. <clears throat> My name is Eddie Castro. My most important title in life is mom to my there you go. kids. Go. I'm a project manager at AT&T and I'm the vice president of membership for Hacemos Selena at AT&T. Here, here. All right. The reason that I, I'm committed to Hacemos is from where I come from. I come from a bottom middle class family. We lived in the ghetto and I went to a private school, so I got all three sectors. I got the richest, I got the kind of rich, <laughs> struggling still, can't buy clothes except from the thrift store, and then the people who can't even eat. So when I'm in uh, Hacemos Atlanta, my gift to the team is to motivate people to want to do more things. And um, how can I leverage my personal power while I'm seeing the 14-year-old who mowed my lawn last year selling drugs on the corner today, where I'm seeing um, a lot of I would say the people that need help. I'm seeing a lot of people who need help. How can I leverage my personal power to help those who are already on their way to success see that although they're struggling, they're making their way up, how they can still give back, and how I can leverage my personal power for those who already have their resources in place, how I can teach them about what's going on and who needs help, and to also help those people in the middle who are on their way up to keep going up. How can I leverage my personal power to influence those people to be responsible with their corporate responsibility? I want to make the point that we are the very few lucky people who work in Atlanta, millions of jobs where we can come to a company that has a resource for diversity and inclusion with money that's not even mine. I'm using the company's money. <laughs> I, can, I have the power to make a real impact oh and it's real for me. I see these people who need it. Mm -hmm. So, so how can we leverage that personal power for that? I'll let you back. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. First yeah. of all, thank you for what you do. I'm really proud that you work for us and what you're doing for our community. Thank you. Uh -huh. you can see it in her passion, can't you? So I, I think <laughs> what, what you love about what I saw there is people who are passionate, you know, find a way to, to use that passion to make something good. Uh, and my experience is the best thing you can do is find an organization that's helping young people. It doesn't matter which one it is. Pick one and help a young person and make that young person a hero. I just came back from Pittsburgh. I serve on the Old Markets Committee of the Boy Scouts of America trying to drive diversity and inclusion in that organization. I had a, a young man, his name was Nathaniel Green. Nathaniel Green was born a crack baby. He, he was raised by his aunt, and he didn't eat solid food till he was three years old. Yeah. But I was in Pittsburgh to give him an eagle. An eagle, eagle is the stuff. highest award that a Boy Scout can ever achieve, and they have only a limited amount of time to do it. That is incredible that you saw a young person who was a crack addict, who was raised in a single parent home in Pittsburgh, and now is getting the highest award ever for the Boy Scouts. That the change in Nathaniel Green's life and his children and his children's children is unmeasurable. So the work you do matters. Keep doing it because it impacts generations of people, not just today. By making him an example, you get other kids off of that environment and you give them and the communities and the communities that they live in a chance for a better life. 
you know, um, so here's some statistics. So first of all, you, you, you know, do what you're doing, okay? The reality is that this was maybe, this data is two years old, I think. 71% of all youth in America, all youth, no matter which poor, where they live, 18 to 24 years of age, cannot qualify for the U.S. military, okay? The reasons are, one, you can't be a felon, so that wipes out some people. You have to have a high school diploma, that wipes out some people. You have to be able to pass a basic math reading test. A bunch of people who have graduated from high school can't pass the test, so they went to high school but they didn't learn anything. 28% are too obese, okay? So America is great in a crisis. We actually have a crisis. We just don't know it. And I was in, back in St. Louis, one of my homes, and um, took my son. I have an adopted son. He's bipolar. He's 19, blah, blah, blah. I took him to the movies. He wanted to go see whatever it was, the uh, software movie or whatever, which was horrible, by the way. And, and I, I, wanted to see, I wanted to see the American, American Sniper. Okay. There you go. But he's my son, so I did what he wanted to do. So we went to the movie he wanted to see. So we left the theater. When American Sniper was letting out, this is an upscale neighborhood, you know, there was a drive by and they you know, targeted a guy and they killed him in front of the theater. The theater was shot up at the same time American Sniper was letting out. America, you know, maybe if you go back every 10 years, there's similar stories, maybe depression, all that. But the reality is, this affects all communities. It's not just in the local community. Mm -hmm. It's not, okay? And things like, unfortunately, things like Ferguson or things like Baltimore are wake-up calls. They really are. And so what happens is when you're talking to people in every day and trying to get them to understand the depth of what you're feeling and the impact they could have, they're busy with their life and they probably can't hear it, okay? But when these things happen and it reaches out and touches them, okay, then the awareness factor goes up orders of magnitude. So what's happening in the St. Louis community right now is really good if it can be sustained. It's really good because everybody is energized to try to make holistic difference. I don't know what's gonna happen in Baltimore, but I suspect a similar thing will take place. I don't know, but it probably will. So what you can do is lead by example and do what you can do. It's the, you know, it's the starfish on the beach thing. You know, it's like you can't save them all, but you mm -hmm. save that one. So do what you can do. I would advise you not to preach to others because you're wasting your energy and time and they will close off to you and never hear you, okay? But you can share. And sharing is not the same as preaching. And you can share. Here's what I've done. Here's what that happened with that person or those people. And here's the fulfillment I got out of that. Isn't that cool, you know? Wouldn't you like to have some fulfillment like that? If not, cool, but maybe you might. If you do, I can point you in the right direction. And so that's the thing, but, but people won't suddenly have an instantaneous wake-up call without a crisis. You know, it just isn't how human beings work. And, um, you know, it's a sad thing, but it's, but it's true. And so it's either a crisis or it's water torture, where you just repeat, 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 until they, like me, you got brainwashed, you want to be a general manager, fortune, whatever, you know? <laughs> so, so that's, you know, that's the deal. So, but keep doing what you're doing, and it's awesome. That's great. Thank How you. many people Thank are you. from AT&T? Raise your hands. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you for wait, being wait, here. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, watch this, watch this. <laughs> How many people are from one of the nine brands in Carnival? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, tell me, what, what are you guys doing here? How come you're not working with guests? Get out of here. <laughs> We're supporting you. <laughs> good deal. All right, good. Uh, hmm? The question should have how many of us have been on one of Oh, that's, how many of you have sailed on one of our nine brands? There you go. How many Thank have you. not? How now many have not? Now the rest of you guys get with the program. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have time for just yeah. one more question. All right, so the last question, this one, um, we've been learning a lot about leadership. I, we, I'm in that uh, program with the, for the young Hispanic uh, leadership development here. Yeah. Yeah. 
So as part of being part of the honorable program, I want to ask you guys, what are the values they have, that you guys stand for and also they have make you successful to, you know, to allow you to be where you are today? I can give you, um, I, I'm, I, I speak to our team all the time about this, so it's not just my values, but what I really think are the values, in my view, this is my personal view of what leaders are all about. And the first one is integrity. If you don't have integrity, I don't want you being a part of my team. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how educated you are. It begins with integrity. That means you do things legally, the correct way, and, and you do it in a way that others will follow you, but follow you in the right path. That's very, very, that's very important when you work internationally, by the way. Right. Exactly. The second thing I would say would be credibility. Do you do what you said you're going to do? If you don't do what you say you're going to do, I don't want you part of my team. You can go be part of any other team. But if you don't have no, integrity, honesty, and credibility, then I think that's the foundation of, of a pyramid of values that I don't care how smart you are, I, I really don't think I want you in my team. I'll quickly get to a, a, a few others. Attitude is hugely important, having a positive attitude like we were talking about, despite all the turmoil, the things that may be around you, if you lack a positive attitude, you will be crushed. Mm -hmm. You will be crushed when you face a big obstacle. Teamwork, you have to be, you have to be a team player. Business is a team sport, so you have to be a team player. You have to really search for excellence every day on the job. How to come in that day and make your business run better than the day before. Or, if not, the competition is going to eventually Beat you. And finally, you have to create the vision and have people trust you and follow you to make that vision a reality. They have to be willing to sacrifice to help you achieve it. If you can get all those things and mixed, you'll be a great leader. So I agree with all those things. I'll just make a couple other quick comments. One is listen. Okay? So in business, it's not that complicated. It's hard to do, but it's not a complicated thing. If you listen to, in our case, our guests, or you listen to your customers, if you really listen to them, they'll tell you what they need and what mm -hmm. you need to do to satisfy them, okay? They will. You gotta practice the skill of listening. You have to be very gifted at listening, but you can practice that skill and become muscle memory and get good at it. Similarly, as a leader in an organization, if you listen to your employees, once you've heard the customer or the guest, if you listen to them, they'll tell you how to deliver to the customer or guest what you need to deliver. You know, I listen to the cabin stewards. I listen to the guys in the, in the galley, you know, who, and the waiters and, and the bar, you know, tenders. I mean, I listen to them. They, they work it every day. And, and if you really listen, you know, they'll give you the answers of how to deliver what you understand the guest needs. So listening is underrated and um, uh, never valued enough, you know. So listening is key. Everything he said, too. And then the, the other thing is... I believe, again, in the human spirit. So one of the things that Monsanto, which very few people, whatever you think of Monsanto, what we really spent an inordinate amount of time on was developing a vision that was human-centered. And the vision was trans abundant food in a healthy environment for everyone on the planet. And how we were going to do that was transform the way food was produced. And a healthy environment meant whatever we did, the environment was going to be better <laughs> than it was before we did it. So very few people know this, but we shut down businesses, we got out of things, we did a lot of stuff, okay? And in the process, we went from less than 20 billion market cap to well over $50 billion of market cap. So we created huge value for the shareholders in the process. But we eliminated, you know, unmeasurable amounts of waste mm -hmm. uh, and, and unmeasurable amounts of, of pollutants and other things with the technologies and, and, and the implementation. And so at Carnival, we have 80 million passenger cruise days a year. We're in 725 ports around the world. Um, we are bringing human capital to lots of places. And the opportunity is there for us to figure out how to harness that human capital so it's enriching for the guests and it's impactful in a positive way for the communities that those guests frequent. And so the other value is make a positive difference in what you do. And, and if you can figure out a way, whatever business you're in, to make a possible, positive difference in what you do, you know, you will not only make money, but you'll make quality of life better. So. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much.
it's been a pleasure. So we, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for sharing your your stories with us. I didn't see Ron. Hey, how, how you doing, oh. man? <laughs> Executive Leadership Council, a sister organization of Hasser, or brother organization to Hasser. Yeah. Yeah, good to see you, Ron. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh no, I said hello to yeah. him as well. It's okay. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. And uh, for the gentleman who asked about values, you have a very nice outline. I was looking for it, and you have uh, actually a chart in your book. Very quickly, tell us the name of your book, and yes. how did you find the time to do that? The, the book is called Obstacles Welcome, and really, the reason I wrote it is because when I told my story, people said, Ralph, you have to tell the story. So yeah. despite having a very, very tough job, I worked uh, for two years over the weekends to write the book because I thought the story had to be told, especially to young people that were impressionable like I was impressionable. So uh, it was- I don't know if uh, you can see it. it <laughs> looks like this. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your writing has a nice ocean blue color. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. Thank you very much. Thank, it's been my pleasure. You. Sid, take it away. All right, well, give another big round of applause to our CEOs, Arnold Donald, President and CEO of Carnival Corporation, Ralph De La Vega, President and CEO, AT&T Mobile and Business Solutions, and 17-time Emmy Award winning journalist, Norma Garcia from Telemundo 39 Dallas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.